Thank you, Terry, for that very kind words. Uh, I'd just like to draw attention to my uh, numerous co-authors and uh, the little subtitle to my talk that, that dull can be important. About 17 years ago, I came across a quote by John Maynard Smith. He was paraphrasing James Watson in a very famous book called The Double Helix, uh, written in 1968, that most scientists are stupid and most of them work on trivial problems. I thought that was mildly uncharitable, so I thought I'd better find out what Watson actually said, and it wasn't, it wasn't actually much better. But a goodly number of scientists are not only narrow-minded and dull, but they're also just stupid. A dull, narrow-minded uh, scientist working on fairly trivial problems, I, I uh, sort of got myself up off up, up the floor and. Uh, thought about that for a while. I actually got some inspiration from it because I, I reckon Watson was trying to say to us that um, uh, if you're going to be in science, you shouldn't shy away from the really difficult, uh, hard, interesting problems in your field. And that's what I, my, my take on it. And I'll, I'll leave you with that thought and I'll come back to it. I think the world is not quite as black and white as Watson uh, made us think there. Um, what I mean by that is that interesting can become dull and dull can become interesting. As we get evidence for questions that we really think are the, the really exciting, important questions, uh, remarkably quickly they can seemingly become dull, uh, even before they're answered properly. And on the other hand, dull, fairly mundane sort of questions as a field progresses can take on a new significance and become important. And I hope to show you examples of both of those today. Um, my main point is that despite the James Watsons of the world, um, that dull can actually be important. My field of research is the implementation of no-take reserves. Why do people set up these permanent uh, places in the marine environment where uh, people don't go fishing? Uh, oops, oh, sorry, go back. Conservation, as everyone knows, um, species, ecosystems, bioregions. The only thing I'm going to say about conservation, it doesn't lock things away, uh, as we found on the Barrier Reef. Uh, conservation can generate enormous amounts of income uh, from tourism, $5 billion in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but the other reason that everyone talks about, and I talk about a lot, is fisheries management. Now, I must be pretty stupid because I've uh, spent the last 30 years of my life trying to convince people who want to catch more fish to stop fishing. At least to stop fishing in some places and not others. Uh, and, uh, it's a, it's a counterintuitive idea and it's a pretty hard gig, I can tell you. It's a not an easy thing uh, to, to, to get across to people. Now, uh, Glenn Ormley, my colleague, did a superb job last night of explaining why I've tried to argue this for a long, long time, that reserves uh, can uh, have fishery benefits if you get recovery of targeted species and there's eventually net export of fish biomass out to the fished areas, either by adult movement or recruitment subsidy in the long term they can actually help to sustain fisheries, particularly reef fisheries. Today I'm going to talk particularly about those processes of recovery and recruitment subsidy. Now, uh, about the last 15 years I've, I've become pretty well convinced there's a lot of scientists in my field who've forgot a few things, and, and forgot a few things in, in terms of answering things properly. And I'll probably get a uh, um, maybe uh, surprise a few people here, but what I mean by properly is absolutely and utterly unequivocal empirical evidence. That's where I'm, I'm going here. Um, the first one, and this will surprise people, that um, reserves produce more fish and bigger fish. And say, come on, Russ, give me a break. Every talk I've been to in the last five years in marine reserves has started with the sentence, we know reserves produce more fish and bigger fish. Let's move on and get on to the interesting stuff. Um, not quite moved on. I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and argue the, the really good empirical studies are, are pretty rare. Um, you may take me to task over a drink later on tonight over that, but, but people have treated that, I reckon, as a dull, boring, trivial sort of question in my field. The other one you might not be able to take me to task on so much is the idea of this degree of rate of recovery. I've got a feeling most people think, yeah, 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 we know they work quickly, let's move on, let's get on to the interesting stuff. Um, and uh, I, I really think that that's a mistake, and I'll, I'll show you why later on in this talk. Uh, and that's been treated, in my opinion, as a pretty dull, boring, trivial question. And the, uh, the one that everyone really wants to answer, the really exciting, important, interesting one, that everyone wants to get on to answering, don't worry about one and two, let's go on with three, 
is this idea of recruitment subsidy that, that reserves are net exporters of, of uh, property goods. It's the, it's the difficult one, because larvae are hard to tag, they're hard to track, they're hard to, all those sorts of things. I'm going to take a look at these three things one by one and see um, how they go. Now, this idea of reserves produce more fish and bigger fish. Dull, boring, pretty trivial. Everyone knows it's true. Let's move on. Um, I guess if you're going to uh, ask dull, boring, trivial questions, one thing I learned as I, as I went along, if you're going to ask dull, boring, trivial questions, at least try and answer them in really exciting, interesting places. <laughs> <laughs> and, and these, these two islands at the top have been um, diving around for the last 28 years, the two at the bottom have been for about a decade. Uh, all four islands had small marine reserves set up by, on, on them by the local communities, small, half a kilometre, three quarters of a kilometre long. The remainder of the perimeter of the islands open to fishing. Um, the question I'm asking here is really simple. Do they produce more fish and bigger fish? And the target group I'm looking at, the group of snappers, emperors, the same sorts of fish we target on Australian coral reefs. And I'm going to show you some information from those four islands. <laughs> Uh, duration of protection on the x-axis, the density of these fish on the, on the y-axis, the black dots and the black lines that you see there, the reserve and the dotted lines and the, and the uh, open circles are the fished areas. Uh, uh, Similar Island over about 16 years of protection, Apo Island over about 28 years of protection, whoops, it's moving, uh, Mantigue over just under a decade and Salino. And in all, all cases, maybe if I point it that way, uh, they started off at pretty much the same point and the, the lines diverged over considerable periods of time as you can see. So pretty good evidence that they produce more fish. What about, which way to point this thing, uh, bigger fish. This is pretty rare data even if I say so myself. It's the proportions of the larger types of fish over 45 centimetres. So Milan, Apo and Mantigue over fairly considerable periods of time as you can see. Uh, Pretty good evidence that over time the proportions of fish got bigger over time. Couldn't see it at Selenog over nearly a decade, not sure why, um, um, uh, uh, but it just shows you that it doesn't always happen. Um, and uh, again, they had the starting point that was similar. Now, if you put um, uh, <coughs> density and size structure together and convert it into biomass, of course you get lovely plots like this. Now, the reason I argue that that's Pretty convincing data. I'm not, I'm not going to show you the benthic data, but I can guarantee you that changes in benthos cannot explain those differences. Um, but the starting points are about the same. Uh, you set up a, a, an experimental manipulation, make some areas reserves, make some area, keep some areas fished, watch the lines diverge over time. It's pretty much a before after control impact pair design. The same thing that Mark uh, McCormick tells the second year students at JCU in terms of environmental impact assessment, and it's pretty convincing results. Now, my, my point really here, here is to say that this sort of data is probably as rare as hen's teeth. Dave Williamson, Nick Graham showed some data um, from um, GBR in Kenya, um, similar. Uh, Graham Edgar in Tasmania has some, but an enormous amount of the data is I went to a reserve, I saw more fish in the reserve, there were less out in the fish area, the reserve did it. <coughs> I ain't so convinced by some of that stuff, and it dominates the reserve literature. Uh, that's my point. Take me to task. Over a bit tonight, if you don't agree. Um, what about this degree and rate of recovery? Well, when I first went to the Philippines uh, nearly 29 years ago, the only people I was talking to that had done a bit of work on the reserves uh, convinced me, well, they work pretty quickly, you know, one or two years and everything will be okay. And I, even before I even got in the water, I thought that was kind of strange. It didn't seem quite the right, um, didn't, didn't seem intuitively the right um, thing to me. Uh, about what, 11 years ago, Nick Graham walked into my uh, room and plonked this paper on my desk and said, have you seen this, Gary? And uh, I hadn't, and I, I read the abstract twice and then ran into Jeff Jones's room and asked him to read it to see if I was reading, got it right. Uh, it's a, a, a meta-analysis. It's a meta-analysis of available data trying to infer rates of change in reserves. Uh, it was done by Ben Halpin, good mate of mine, Bob Warner, one of my heroes. Um, but it, it re re reached some rather strange conclusions. Most of the data it looked at were spatial comparisons at one point in time, in reserve, outside reserve, uh, and inferring that the reserve did it. Um, and essentially, uh, you'll notice that about seven of their um, 80 studies had actual temporal monitoring. Um, but uh, interestingly enough, as you can see, there's no pattern in that data. In fact, if you look at the probabilities, uh, they should never have ever concluded anything from that data. 
uh, and, it, and it, they were in a second year biometry class, they, they failed. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but the fact of the matter is that that's one of the most cited papers in the marine reserve literature, 200 plus citations in nine years. And what it says is that reserves will work quickly. And, and, they, and they should never have said it. Um, it. Well, should never have said it on scientific grounds, but I think it sends a really, really poor message that everything's going to happen in the first few years and don't worry about it for the next 40 years because it's all pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, um, now, I have to acknowledge Bob Geldof here for mentioning this stuff. Thanks, Bob. But uh, this is the, uh, the, the stuff that Simon was talking about earlier on in his talk. Um, you might recognise this, it's very similar to what I've shown already, it's a cement on an apo. And we've um, basically plotted biomass against reserve protection and fitted a logistic curve to it. And uh, we kind of, kind of broke the old adage of science that you never, you know, never extrapolate beyond your data and behave you're a dull, boring scientist working on trivial problems, you can do just about anything really. Uh, but we uh, extrapolated out and asked the question, how long will it take for these, these curves to asymptote? Yeah, it was decades, basically. Uh, yes, life history characteristics are slow, slow long the uh, slow growing, low recruitment rates and so forth. But it sure as heck isn't one to two years in most, most cases. It takes a long time, and that's an important point that I want to come back to in a moment. So what about this last important, really important question, the recruitment subsidy question, the in interesting, exciting one? Now, why is it important? Uh, it's important for the following reason, and, and Glenn, again, um, said this superbly last night, that people like Dave Williamson, Richie Evans and myself in 2002, 2003 would go on to stakeholder meetings with the old data from the old zoning on the Barrier Reef and say, look at this guys, more fish and bigger fish in the, in the in reserves. And the invariable response we'd get from fishers was, well that's bloody great mate, more fish and bigger fish where I can't fish, what use is it to me? And it's a, it's a pretty good argument, you know, what use is it to me? And we would sit there and wave our arms and say, yes, 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 but more fish and bigger fish will produce more proper gills, given the scale of the reserves and the scale of dispersal. It's almost certain that you'll get recruitment subsidy. Proven. Proven would be the response, as Glenn said last night. So this next bit is about this proven bit, about this idea you get net larval export from reserves. Now you've heard a, a little bit about this yesterday, the Keppel Islands experiment. There's a, a few of the team, uh, led by the inimitable Professor Jeff Jones, Dave Williamson and Greg uh, Ormany, uh, Glenn Ormany, sorry, Glenn, uh, spoke yesterday. Uh, and uh, Hugo Harrison is our, our genetics jock who's done a lot of this work. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about um, a stripy snapper. It's a, a small little snapper, also targeted by, uh, by, uh, <laughs> by fishers. And uh, as Glenn, and, uh, Glenn uh, described last night, we used a parentage analysis. We caught about 1,400 of these fish, uh, the adults, uh, in the, in the no-take zones in the Keppel Islands, so three little no-take zones I'll show you in a moment. About 500 recruits used about 14 microsatellites uh, to do the parentage analysis. Um, Hugo Harrison did most of that. And it's, it's kind of science that I, I kind of reckon James Watson would even be impressed by, quite frankly. Um, and there's the result. Don't worry too much about all the arrows. The, the, the bottom line is actually, of this slide is on the top line, uh, the, the Keppel Islands parentage result. Basically 28% of the green zones in the, in the Keppel Islands produced about 46% of the recruitment in the fished areas. In the case of coral trout, you heard from Glenn last night, it was 57. But what that says is two things. Number one, the green zones are connecting to the blue zones. But number two, those small green zones, those little circled areas that we sampled, and a few, a few of the others, uh, are punching well above their weight in terms of area, about by a factor of about two. In other words, they're producing twice as much <coughs> proper gills as you would expect by area alone. Now, why would that be? That would be because there's about twice as much biomass as stripes inside those green zones. And even further, Richie Evans, who I don't think is in the room anymore, actually looked at the egg production inside those reserves and showed that it was about two and a half times higher in the green than the blue. So not only had we shown recruitment subsidy, but we had a really good explanation as to why it, it, it had actually occurred. So we were Eureka. We've, just, we've, we've shown recruitment subsidy for the first time ever. So we did what everyone else does, and we sent it off to science. And uh, uh, just, just to point out that the answer to that question three was uh, dependent on the, on the answers to questions one and two. Well, we sent this manuscript off to science because we were so happy about it. And, uh, oh, 
Hang on. Our important, interesting, exciting result turned out to be not so interesting and exciting. Because this paper was rejected, and it was rejected because of the following two sentences by one of the reviewers. Now, I've got to put this down from here for a moment, because if I read this, uh, I might throw the little control. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the major limitation of this paper is the insight from the result. As I interpret the findings, the authors have found that the reserves contribute larvae to the larger regional pool roughly in proportion to the relative biomass of fishes contained within the reserves. I don't think this is a surprise. <laughs> so, that's why we were rejected. We were rejected for showing what we were trying to show. <laughs> um, so, um, so, in the space of... Uh, uh, so, you know... <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm still speechless. I'm still speechless. <laughs> Sorry, lucky like, like I put that control on. Um, but, but essentially, what, what, what happened here is, you know, the, the, the most exciting, interesting, important question that I could think of in my field in the last 30 years, and I finally got to answer it with good friends and colleagues like, like Ben and, and Dave and others, um, and the first review that looks at it says, that's not so surprising. That's not interesting. A bit predictable, really. A bit dull. A bit boring. <laughs> a bit trivial. I'm back to asking trivial, boring questions. All over again. Bugger me, how do I feel? I feel... I feel, I, I feel so inadequate. I feel so... so I don't know, cerebrally bankrupt. So, intellectually inept. So philosophically flaccid. <laughs> What are you going to do? It's a tough gig, science, isn't it? It's a very tough gig. But wait a minute, I've got one more chance to, uh, to, to, to be famous. Hang on. <laughs> we're also working on this in the Philippines. Uh, and we're doing it with uh, a great group of people. Led, uh, with one of my students and now post, uh, uh, working with the UNA Abbasamas. And we're looking at this idea of whether recruit, uh, more, uh, reserve networks can, can be net exporters of, of, of recruits. Just the same question as in the Keppel Islands. We've got a, a, a network of 39 small reserves, a very sophisticated larval dispersal model, similar to the ones that Jonathan Poole works on on a, on a much larger scale in the Philippines and, and elsewhere. Um, and some of the inputs into this data are pretty useful. Now, you might recognise some of this data. It's actually not abundances of large fish. It's actually their egg production rates. We've got really good um, um, fecundity size relationships for large tropical snappers. The same four islands I showed you before supplemented with some work from uh, 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 Brian Stockwell in the inshore reserves. And you can see the green areas are closed, the blue are the open. Essentially, remarkably high um, uh, egg production rates in these reserves the longer you protect them. So what did the simulations say? Well, it was pretty interesting, really, or depending on your perspective, pretty boring. Um, but the, um, the y-axis is the amount of recruitment going into the fished areas. So the blue basically is the recruitment from the, um, the fished areas. The uh, green is the supplement from those reserves into the fished areas, essentially. Um, for 6%, which is the current coverage in that area of, of no-take zones, and we've simulated for 10 and 15%. And turns out that the really critical thing you've got to know is the rate at which these things recover. Uh, so that uh, the longer you, longer you protect them, the greater the recruitment subsidy becomes, uh, such that when you get to 15% uh, um, coverage and about to, uh, protect all reserves for 20 years, the amount of recruitment coming out of those reserves could be potentially eight times that in the fish areas. And that's uh, an incredible result um, and, a, and a remarkably useful one, or boring, if you can take that perspective. Um, but my point here is that the answer to that question Three, a really exciting one, depends absolutely on the answers to questions one and two. So to sum up, um, sometimes you really do have to answer the dull, boring questions to answer the, the really exciting ones. Uh, in the context of this, this uh, talk, um, that you've really got to know something about the degree and rate of recovery uh, before you start interpreting recruitment subsidy. <sighs> So how do I feel about myself now? I, I'm feeling a little bit better. I, I feel my scientific self-esteem is coming back. My hypothesizing hairy chest of this, my laboratory <laughs> ego is all flooding back to me. Maybe dull can be important after all. Thank you. But the signal just wasn't there in their data.
is what I would say. Is that sort of answer your question? <laughs>